Yoo-hoo! Are you there? Oh, good! <laughs> you just have to learn what I'm going to teach you today. Can you believe this is video number 199? And it's the fourth video on the unit on osteoporosis. Now, you already know how critical it is to watch every single video in order. And so far, you've learned the definition of osteoporosis in video 196, the effects of puberty and menopause on your bone in video 197, and the incidence of osteoporosis in video 198. So today, we're going to talk about the architecture of your bone, and I'll explain why you fracture some bones more than others. In my book, regardless of whether you have the first edition or the second edition, this material is in chapter 29 under the heading entitled Architecture, Bone Architecture. Now you might be saying, architecture? <laughs> Why in the world is she talking about architecture? This channel is supposed to be about menopause. <laughs> and if you are saying that, I understand. But the word architecture means structure. So we're really talking about the structure of your bone. And if you're wondering why you need to know anything about the structure of your bone, you really need to watch this video on the structure of your bone. Because the structure of your bone is directly tied to whether or not it's prone to osteoporosis. So to get started, let's answer a quiz question. Now, surprisingly, most of you like my quiz questions. I think you see the value in discovering firsthand what you do or do not know. So here it is. Which of the following is true with regard to bone structure? A. Throughout your body, you have many different kinds of bone, but there is no correlation between the kind of bone and its tendency to fracture as a result of osteoporosis. B. All bone is created equal. Propensity for osteoporosis in any given bone is dependent on wear and tear. C. There is only one type of bone that is prone to osteoporosis. The risk of fracture is greater wherever you have that kind of bone. D. Bone structure is irrelevant with regard to osteoporosis. All that matters is quantity. E. Calcium determines the structure of your bone, and you can control the structure of your bone by taking calcium. F is A and E above. G is B and E above. H is C and E above. I is D and E above. Do you know the answer? Did the quiz question make you question what you thought you knew? Here it is again with the answer in bold. So that forms the basis of our discussion. Now, you probably think of buildings when you hear the word architecture. So let's use buildings as an analogy for our discussion. Here, I have some Lego bricks. I actually have many more Lego bricks than this. <laughs> and I have built two houses with these Legos. This building has an intricate and complex network of cross beams for stability and strength. It's so sturdy that there are fewer rooms in the building. And the rooms that do exist are small. There are no big open roomy spaces at all. Instead, there are many supporting walls linking the entire structure together in a way that makes it very strong. Now, this other building does not have much in the way of cross beams. So it's not very sturdy. It's all one open space in this building. And the room is big, wide open, very roomy. This one is built with that open concept style, with the living 
dining, den, kitchen, and all the other things in the one same big space. So there are just the basic bare minimum supporting walls, mostly on the outside edges of the building. Now, if I drop these two buildings on the floor, which one do you think is more likely to break? <laughs> Well, look at that. The Lego building with more supporting walls and fewer open spaces did just fine. But the one with very few supporting walls and lots of big open spaces really fractured. And there's pieces all over, and I have a big mess to clean up now. <laughs> because I didn't expect it to fracture that much. <laughs> well, guess what? The bones in your body are just like the architectural integrity of a building. Of course, you don't get to construct your body from scratch like an architect does. You have to work with what's already there. And it just so happens that you have two types of bone. You have bones that are like each of the two Lego buildings, and only one of them is prone to osteoporosis and fracture. The vast majority of your bone is called cortical bone. Examples are the long bones of your arms, the long bones of your legs, and the flat bones of your ribs and your skull and your pelvic girdle. So long or flat, cortical bone, long or flat. Gee, that's practically a whole skeleton. Cortical bone encompasses 80% of all your bone. And that's a good thing because cortical bone is not prone to osteoporosis. Why not? Because it's hard and strong and very densely packed. It's like the Lego building that didn't break. But let's use another prop to resemble cortical bone even better than the building. You see this Brillo pad? This is a very good representation of what cortical bone is like. As I thought about good props to demonstrate cortical bone, a Brillo pad just popped into my mind. <laughs> of course, I had to go out and buy one because I certainly didn't own any. <laughs> and now I have a whole box of them that I probably will never use. <laughs> but a Brillo pad sure does mimic cortical bone very well. The fact that it's densely packed means that it has a small surface area to volume ratio. It's all bunched up which means there are very teeny tiny spaces between the fibers of this Brillo pad. That's exactly the case with cortical bone. And the smaller the spaces, the stronger the bone, and the less likely it is to fracture. Cortical bone also contains more calcium, which of course makes sense. I've taught you that calcium determines bone strength. So here you have one kind of bone with a lot of calcium in it, and it's very strong. And over the course of your lifetime, you lose about 35% of your cortical bone. The other kind of bone is called trabecular bone. Trabecular bone encompasses the rounded, strangely shaped bones of your spinal column and the round, strangely shaped bone of your hip joint, this round, weird shaped bone here, and the small, round bones here in your wrist. So instead of long or flat bones, trabecular bone dominates all the round, compact bones in your body. And trabecular bone encompasses only 20% of your bone. And it's the bone that is prone to osteoporosis and fracture. 
Why? Because it's porous or spongy. That rounded bone straight shape makes for an open space inside that is larger. And that larger space is porous and spongy, which makes it very weak and it's very loosely packed. You see this loofah-like sponge? It's a good example of what trabecular bone is like. And I didn't have to go out and buy it. In contrast to the Brillo pad, it's loosely packed. The fact that it's so loosely packed means that it has a large surface area to volume ratio. It's not all bunched up, it's loose and open, which means that there are large spaces between its fibers. See, I can even get my fingers into these spaces. That's precisely the case with trabecular bone. And the larger the spaces, the weaker the bone, and the more likely it is to fracture. Trabecular bone contains less calcium. This makes sense too. Once again, calcium determines strength of bone, and this kind of bone contains less calcium, so it's weak. And over the course of your lifetime, you lose 50% of your trabecular bone. Here's a photo of these two types of bone. And here's a chart depicting what you have learned so far. And on this chart, I've tried to use textures to reflect the differences in these two types of bone on the chart itself. <laughs> what you see is that 80% of your bone is cortical bone, while only 20% is trabecular bone. And as far as the locations where you have different kinds of bone, you primarily have trabecular bone in your spine, hip, and wrist, but everywhere else you have cortical bone. You see that cortical bone is hard, while trabecular bone is porous or spongy. Cortical bone is dense, but trabecular bone is loose. And the surface area to volume ratio of cortical bone is small, but for trabecular bone, it's large. Cortical bone is strong, and trabecular bone is weak. Cortical bone has lots of calcium, while trabecular bone has little. And cortical bone does not fracture easily, but trabecular bone does. And finally, you lose only 35% of your cortical bone, but 50% of your trabecular bone. Now let's linger on that last item a bit. I just said that you lose only 35% of your cortical bone, but 50 percent of your trabecular bone. Why do you suppose there's a difference? Because it goes back to what I told you in videos 196 and 197 about the conveyor belt. It has to do with bone turnover. The conveyor belt for your cortical bone is slower than the conveyor belt for your trabecular bone. In other words, the long and flat bones of your arms, legs, ribs, skull, and pelvic girdle stay on the conveyor belt for a long time, while the round bones of your spine, hip, and wrist stay on the conveyor belt for a short time. And the shorter the time on the conveyor belt, the more possible it is to have more bone, bone turnover and more bone loss. So the two types of bone are different in just about every way possible. And of course, I have simplified this a bit because most parts of your skeleton really have a combination of both cortical and trabecular bone. For instance, most bones consist of the hard, compact cortical bone on the outside and the soft, spongy trabecular bone on the inside. That's why the surface area of bone is so important. When you have a long bone like your arm or leg or a flat bone, it will have a lot of the hard cortical bone outside surrounding and just a little bit of the spongy trabecular bone on the inside. But with the small round bones of your spine, hip, and wrist, there's a lot of the spongy trabecular type of bone on the inside. 
and only a little bit of the strong cortical bone on the outside. So for purposes of osteoporosis, the risk of fracture is all about the relative quantities of these two types of bone. Round bones have much more of the osteoporosis prone spongy trabecular bone that makes them vulnerable to fracture. Now if you look at the skeleton, you see that the majority of the hard cortical bone is on the periphery, on the outer parts of the body. But the weak spongy trabecular bone is located more interiorly. And the spine and the hip bones are very central. So going back to our Lego buildings, this is how the bones of your arms, legs, ribs, and skull are designed. It represents bones that is mostly cortical in nature. That's why it doesn't fracture easily. On the contrary, this, this is how the bones <laughs> of your spine, hip, and wrist are designed, and it represents bone that is mostly trabecular in nature, and that's why it does fracture easily. In video 196, you learned that osteoporosis means bone loss. And the less bone there is in the first place, the more of an effect bone loss will have on the bone. So osteoporosis is a process that affects trabecular bone much more significantly than cortical bone. So your already loosely packed trabecular bone goes from this, where the holes are possible to put my fingers in, but not that big, to this, where the holes get really, really, really big. And what you'll see in the upcoming videos is that your spine, hip, and wrist are the three sites that are vulnerable to fracture from bone loss. But we'll, what will really shock you is the rate of bone loss. And that's what I'll talk about in the next video. I would say that understanding the rate of bone loss is the most critical factor in understanding why osteoporosis at menopause is so important. So don't miss the next video. And if you need me to help you personally with anything, schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation at menopausetaylor.me. Please follow me on face Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to my channel. Get all your friends to subscribe to my channel. Let's help change the world to, to a better place for all women. I'll see you in a week. Bye.